Coming up today, South Korea's top diplomat accuses North Korea of thumbing its nose to the United Nations with its stream of reckless provocations. He also calls on the UN Security Council to take action on the regime's human rights abuses. Lawmakers at South Korea's National Assembly are quizzing government officials for a fourth and final day, this time on the educational and social issues affecting the nation. Plus, hundreds of African migrants are feared dead after their boat capsizes off the coast of Egypt. Four crew members have been detained. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello, it's noon on Friday, the 23rd of September. You're tuned in to our midday newscast here on Arirang TV. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this afternoon, South Korea's foreign minister has urged the world to get much more serious about the threats posed by North Korea. Following its recent nuclear test, Minister Yim byung se says North Korea's nuclear program is in its final stage of development. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Gon Soa, starts us off. North Korea is now in the final stage of nuclear weaponization, was the blunt warning issued by South Korea's top diplomat Yoon Byung-se. In his keynote speech to the UN General Assembly Thursday, Minister Yoon said the two nuclear and 22 missile tests this year alone show the regime's nuclear program has neared a tipping point. The latest nuclear test was the strongest ever. The test in total was also significantly reduced from average three years to eight months. Given North Korea's unpredictability and its penchant for provocations, its next nuclear provocations may come even sooner than we expect. With North Korea ignoring its international obligations, Minister Yoon said a fundamental question which many members are already raising is whether North Korea actually deserves to be a member of the United Nations. Seoul's top diplomat also slammed the regime for wasting money on its weapons development while disregarding the needs of its own people, as it conducted its fifth nuclear test while the country was suffering some of the worst flooding in decades. Prior to his speech, Minister Yoon told reporters that it's time for the UN Security Council to take its discussions on North Korea's human rights violations a step further and take, quote, meaningful action. According to a South Korean government official, the UN Security Council is mulling whether to include Pyongyang's human rights abuses on a new sanctions resolution currently under discussion following the North's recent nuclear test. While it's the UN Human Rights Council that usually deals with human rights issues, the UN Security Council is the only organ of the United Nations that has the authority to issue binding resolutions to members. That's why the Security Council's approach to human rights issues has been under the microscope for a long time. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now, the chief nuclear envoys of South Korea and China have agreed on the need for strong countermeasures against North Korea in light of the regime's latest provocation. Kim hong Kyun, Seoul Special Representative for Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs and his Chinese counterpart, Wu Dawei, met in Beijing on Thursday, the country's first face-to-face -face meeting since Pyongyang conducted its nuclear test on September 9th. Now, diplomatic sources say the two officials noted the seriousness of the situation and discussed possible sanctions on the North Korean regime. However, it is not known to what extent the level of sanctions was discussed. Beijing is generally opposed to excessive sanctions based on concerns it could lead to the collapse of the regime in North Korea. In contrast, Seoul and Washington favor strong punitive measures. The U.S. State Department has launched a plan to expand the free flow of information into North Korea. The Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor announced the plan this week, which includes a call for proposals related to the initiative. The goal is to increase the North Korean public's access to independent information that provides a range of viewpoints and increases exposure to free speech environments. Applicant organizations need to produce content that will be 
interesting to North Koreans while also creating new mediums for sharing it. The department is also looking into ways to send tablets, cell phones and radios, among other electronic devices, into North Korea. The U.S. has allocated 1.6 million U.S. dollars for the project and the call is open through the end of October. North Korea's test of a new rocket engine this week demonstrates that Pyongyang could potentially send unmanned probes to the moon. This is according to a U.S. missile expert in an article carried on the U.S.-based North Korea monitoring website 38 North. John Schilling, a top aerospace engineer with expertise on the North missile program, said even though the engine isn't right for intercontinental ballistic missiles, the North has already demonstrated that it can build large rockets using both solid and high-energy liquid propellants. He said the new engine is too big and too powerful for use in the ICBMs the North has been developing, such as the KN-08 and KN-14 road mobile missiles. But, he added, the new engine could be used in rockets for outer space missions. He said the world should start thinking about how to live with a North that has such capabilities. Over to the National Assembly now, where the final parliamentary Q&A session has been postponed until later this afternoon due to a disagreement between the rival political parties over a recent cabinet appointment. At a plenary session initially scheduled to take place this morning before the Q&A, the parties clashed over a motion to support Kim Jae-su to the position of Agriculture Minister. The opposition parties say Kim is unfit because of alleged ethical lapses that include allegations of questionable real estate transactions when he was the president of the Korea Agro Fisheries and Food Trade Corporation. Now the Q&A session is slated to get started at 2 p.m. this afternoon, a little under two hours from now, and lawmakers are expected to question government officials on education and social issues. Korea provides various small loan programs for people with low incomes and the process to get such loans is about to get a lot easier thanks to a one-stop hub in the centre of the capital. Attending the opening of the Korea Inclusive Finance Agency on Friday, President Park and hae asked officials to develop customised microfinancing programmes through consultations with applicants so the public can efficiently manage their debts and better plan their finances. A national network of 33 microfinancing centres will be up and running by the end of the year since the launch of the first centre back in 2014. Now, in uh, slightly concerning economic news, Korea's ex exports to China have plunged for 14 straight months now. The Korea International Trade Association says the country's outbound shipments to China dropped around 5% in August from a year earlier. Korea's exports to its largest trading partner have been on a downward slide since July of 2015, when the figure went down by 6.5% on year. The pace of decline, however, is showing signs of improvement. The drop in exports to China in August represents the smallest margin of decrease this year. In January, exports to China plunged more than 20%. Around 20,000 unionised bank workers are staging a strike to protest the adoption of a performance-based wage system. The strike began about two hours ago at Sang-Am World Cup Stadium in Western Seoul. The Korean Financial Industry Union, which claims roughly 100,000 members nationwide, initially expected at least 70,000 workers to take part. But with the lower-than-expected turnout, the majority of banks are seeing their daily operations running pretty much as normal. The government has been pushing to implement a system where salaries are based on performance to raise the sector's competitiveness. But the union argues that it's only aimed at maximising short-term uh, performance and will lead to unnecessary internal competition. The union's last strike was held two years ago. Now, nearly eight 
1,600 foreign visitors were denied no visa entry to Korea's southern Jeju Island between January and the end of August this year. Data from the Ministry of Justice shows 1.3% of all applicants have been refused entry this year. The same ratio was a third of 1% in 2014, the Korean Immigration Service says most of those re refused entry had not properly clarified the purpose of their visit, while some were found to be travelling on fake passports. Authorities believe some of these applicants try and enter Jeju illegally and then attempt to secure a job either on the island or in another part of Korea. Since the Jeju provincial government enacted its no visa entry policy in 2002, nearly 3 million foreigners have travelled there under the programme, with 99% being Chinese nationals. Hundreds of people are believed dead after a boat carrying 450 migrants capsized off the coast of Egypt. The tragedy comes as a growing number of migrants are turning to Egypt as a departure point to get to Europe. Park Chung Hong has this report. A day after the shipwreck, rescue workers are pulling up bodies, not survivors. 169 people were rescued from the Mediterranean, but hundreds more might have perished at sea. Sources say the boat was carrying almost 600 migrants fleeing Egypt for Europe, probably Italy, with the help of smugglers who reportedly added dozens more passengers before setting off. Overloading is believed to have caused the boat to sink. Egyptian police have detained four crew members ahead of an investigation. Officials say the boat was carrying not only Egyptian, but also Sudanese, Eritrean and Somali migrants. Egyptian Prime Minister Sheriff Ismail pledged the government will make every effort for the rescue mission and added those responsible must be brought to justice. In previous months, an increasing number of people have been trying to reach Italy from the African coast, especially Libya, where people traffickers are thriving. But Egypt has come under scrutiny as more and more migrants from sub-Saharan Africa are using it as an alternative route. The survivors cited a lack of jobs, low incomes and political repression in Egypt as their reasons for fleeing the region. Park Jong Hong, Arirang News. Protests are continuing for a third straight night in Charlotte, North Carolina. As of now, the protests haven't turned violent as they did on Tuesday and Wednesday. With the National Guard deployed, the city's mayor has signed an order for a curfew to take effect from midnight through 6 a.m. Friday local time. That means the curfew is set to start in under an hour from now. The nightly curfews will remain in effect until the end of the state of emergency is declared. Emergency services in Charlotte have confirmed that a protester who was wounded by gunshot in last night's riots has died. The protest was sparked following the police shooting of an African-American man earlier this week. U.S. tech company Yahoo has announced that uh, data associated with at least 500 million user accounts has been stolen. Yahoo says it believes a state-sponsored actor was behind the 2014 data breach, meaning an individual acting on behalf of a government. Yahoo has stopped short of singling out a particular country, though. The account information may include names, email addresses, telephone numbers and dates of birth, but Yahoo believes it didn't include financial data like bank account numbers and credit card data. Yahoo urges users to change their password and security questions and to review their accounts for any suspicious activity. Now, the image of a Syrian boy sitting in an ambulance covered in dust and blood after his home was hit by a bomb in the war-torn country grabbed headlines around the world last month. Now, a letter by a six-year-old American boy has captured the world's attention once again. Han Van has a story. A letter written by a six-year-old boy from New York named Alex has once again focused the world's attention on the Syrian refugee crisis. He writes, Dear President Obama, remember the boy that was picked up by the ambulance in Syria? Can you please go get him and bring him to our home? We will give him a family and he will be our brother. 
The tragic image of the Syrian boy, Omran Daknish, which vividly captured the reality of the ongoing civil war, sent shockwaves across the world last month. I will be waiting for you guys with flags, flowers, and balloons. The U.S. president shared the letter with the world during his speech at the United Nations Summit on Refugees. Those are the words of a six-year-old boy. The humanity that a young child can display, who hasn't learned to be cynical or suspicious or fearful of other people. President Obama has posted a video of Alex reading the letter out loud on Facebook. The post has since garnered thousands of likes and shares, demonstrating that genuine compassion for our fellow human beings still has the power to move the world. And then, I did news. Well, those are stories we are following on this Friday afternoon here in Seoul. For more of the latest, don't forget to check out the website, adidang.com forward slash news. Have a great day, and if we don't see you, a wonderful weekend. Goodbye.